we were chatting about the context of nutrition, right? Who to trust in the space in terms of what diet do you follow? You know, what do you adhere to? It's so challenging. It's worse than politics. And I was saying, I think the people that I've come to trust most in the health space are those who aren't really sure of themselves, right? Mm. And that sounds counterintuitive, but I think it's the folks that use language like, you know, this may have an effect or, you know, there's a lot of nuance involved. I think the people who are quote unquote, so sure of things and certain are the ones that you really have to question. Mm. I think if you're so rigid in your thought that you're not open to new modalities, it means that there's something deeper at play there, right? Rather than just your belief in whatever your belief is. It's about you wanting to be right. Welcome to Gut Chick Radio, the holistic health podcast where we explore the uniqueness of the human experience to help you navigate your health journey. I'm Nick Belden, a chiropractic physician and functional medicine practitioner. And you all know what's coming next, but the information provided in this podcast is for educational entertainment purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, cure, or treat any disease and do not apply any of the information here without first speaking with your physician. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Gut Check Radio. We're taking a little bit of break from the thyroid series to bring you guys another fantastic interview. And I'm sorry, I know it's been a little bit since I've done an interview, but it, you are going to be so thankful that you got to hear this one. This one was so powerful, so cool, such an enlightening and uplifting message, such an uplifting human to talk to. I had the pleasure, the honor, the fun, the grace to speak with Jacqueline Genova. She has such a fantastic story of how she came into the world of integrative and holistic cancer care through her mom's own breast cancer diagnosis. And that forced her to dive deep down the rabbit hole of all things, nutritional supplements, mindfulness, sleep, exercise, all things holistic and integrative that you could do to support overall cancer treatment and and really the environment of cancer. And I know the word, the word cancer in the health and wellness community, it comes with a lot of weight. It's very heavy. There's a lot of fear, a lot of misunderstanding. And Jacqueline does a fantastic job in this episode of at sort of decoding some of that misunderstanding and, and sort of some of that scarcity and really sheds light to the idea of in the traditional cancer realm, there is a lot of fear, like I said earlier, and there's a lot of absolutism that comes from a lot of people high up in the cancer space. And she talks about not only the story of her mother, but the story of her brand, Well and Strong, which is fantastic. If you have not checked it out before, her website, her blogs, her articles, even her podcast, which I had the pleasure of being on a couple months ago, shameless plug, I would highly recommend. We'll put all the information to it in the show notes. She even talked about a free guide that talks about eating for breast cancer, which is fantastic. But I think what is my one of my favorite parts about this interview in this episode was her emphasis on there is hope and there is more than one answer. There's more than one way to skin a cat, for lack of a better term, when it comes to the cancer realm and how there's so many stories. And yes, it's an anecdote, but anecdote drives research. Without anecdote, we have nothing. That anecdote, we have nothing. So many of these anecdotes and personal wins and personal developmental stories about people who have overcome cancer, not only just physiologically, but spiritually. For those of you who've been listening for a while, you know I talk a lot about body, mind, spirit, and the suffering and the healing that needs to happen at all three levels. And sometimes being told you have cancer can be very spiritually challenging. So if you don't have a foundation, if there's no faith practice in place, that diagnosis itself might crush you. And not only physiologically at the bottom, at the level of body and mind might it crush you, but if it spiritually crushes you, then that is something we want to really try and support. So we, we talk a lot about those things. We also talk about some really cool therapies that happen in, in the cancer space of between IV vitamin C and other different nutritional realms, ketogenic diet, fasting, and a lot of things that are very popular in the nutrition space, in the nutrition space, excuse me, talk about things in the cancer world. And she was such a beam of light to talk to. It, it's so fun to talk about people who have a similar idea, not only of just positivity, but just giving you a semblance of hope and faith with your health and wellness. And knowing, like I said, that there's a, a multiplicity of approaches and that you don't have to be tied down to whatever one person says. It is your health, it is your body. You you can do with it what you please, but there are numerous resources at your disposal. If you, if you or a loved one 
are dealing with any sort of cancer, cancer scare, what well, it is scary or cancer care, I highly recommend you check out this episode, check out all the resources, check out her website, check out all the information she has, consume as much as you can about this so you can have a well-rounded approach and you can approach this phase of life, this very difficult and trying seasonal life, if that is for you, with as much information as you can handle. And without further ado, let's get into my interview with Jacqueline. So that you said something earlier, like as the well and strong brand has taken off, because the podcast is fairly new in the in the whole schema of the brand of well and strong. Yeah, my podcast, I started my podcast in May of this year, which is mm -hmm. insane. So I've published 28 episodes so far. It has definitely been a journey. I cringe when I look back and listen to the first like 10. You have to. You, you have to. Yeah. to get, <laughs> I started to get the hang of it. I'm learning how to use Descript and editing and all that fun stuff. But it's it's been a joy to be able to sit down with the people whom I've admired for so long in the health space and actually have a conversation with them, right? Like right. not just hear their words on the, you know, or read their words on books and actually like, yeah, it's been fun. I've been yeah. enjoying it. Had you wanted to have started one for a while or did it just, were you like, there was so many other things going on with the brand that the podcast was just. Yeah. You know, it's really funny, Nick. I mean, I feel like this resonates with you. It's funny how God works. Right. And I feel like sometimes he just inserts things in our stories that make him chuckle because in the moment, like, we're like, what is going on? And then like later, we're like, oh, I understand. But I actually was kind of first exposed to podcasting last year when I started helping out with this organization called Healing Strong. And they started their own podcast at the time, like the founder was looking for someone to help like manage that, like an admin person. So I basically learned everything I needed to know through that. I didn't like talk. I wasn't a host. I just did the Buzzsprout stuff. I did scheduling. I learned, mm. you know, the nuances of how it works. And then a year later, I just had random people just kind of like drop me notes, like saying, you know, you should start a podcast. Like people that didn't even like know me just like say random things like, oh, so like when's the podcast coming out? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And then I was like, you know what? I should start a podcast because I love people. I enjoy these conversations. And yeah, it was just something I wanted to do for a while. So I just kind of bought a mic, did some Google, like, research on how to use Riverside and just, yeah, went from there, but it's, it's been fun. Oh my goodness. So does that mean that that season were you balancing like your brand working or helping out this brand and also your full-time career? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That, 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 yeah. That's like a theme for you, which, which I love though, that it's like, there's so much time to be able to devote, or there's not enough time to be able to devote to all of our passions, but yet we can still use the available time we have to pursue those. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. It'll be three years, November 15th, since I started well and strong, which is ah, pretty. Okay. So three yeah. years ago, I imagine though, that's when it started. The making of that is probably mm -hmm. 10 plus years in the making. Yeah. 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 I'd say my interest in wellness and integrative medicine really started in 2008 when my mom was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. And I just, from that, like there on out, just started to really hone in on cancer specifically from an integrative standpoint. And then went to college, which is it's kind of funny. People are like, oh, like what's your background health? I'm like, no, I graduated with a degree in finance and economics from a school known for entrepreneurship. But during my college undergrad years, I participated in this honors program where you basically could write a thesis on any topic under the sun. And I loved writing. I primarily did it because, you know, I, I was like, this is great. You could pick any topic you wanted. I'm going to write about integrative medicine. And senior year essentially wrote a thesis on a new model for our healthcare system, which is using integrative medicine with a specific focus on cancer. And in that paper, Nick, I explored all these different complementary treatment modalities for cancer, like high dose IVC, mistletoe therapy, ozone, the list goes on. And as you would have it, again, how God works a year later after writing that thesis, we found out my mom's cancer came back. Hmm. So I, at that point, already had a solid understanding of how cancer metastasis happened. I had a whole chapter dedicated to that in my paper. And I also was kind of equipped with some of these complementary therapies that I had researched and wrote about. 
for my mom to possibly consider. So yes, to answer your question, well, and strong was definitely, uh, I mean, this, the actual start formation of it was three years ago, but it started well before then. Mm. And if you can take us back to that moment where you found out your mother was diagnosed, was it a, a flip of the switch for you to go down the rabbit hole? Or was there a, a transition of understanding what even cancer was? And then that led you down to reading everything you can get your hands on? Yeah, I was, how do I describe it? I was really in a state of just like paralysis, right? Mm. In the sense of when you're just bombarded with so much information, it is so hard to navigate what to do next, right? And that obviously looking back, it's like you just take one step in one direction. It's better than just standing still. But yeah, I was just incredibly overwhelmed. And I really used Well and Strong as it it was a saving grace for me in more ways than one. So I'll backtrack. It was born during a really difficult time in my life. I was just coming out of a pretty long-term relationship and didn't have anything really to look forward to. You know, my mom was going through this and I wanted to do something to help other people, right? Because I think during our difficulties, the best thing you can do is to shift your focus on helping other people. So I started this platform not knowing what would happen, where it would take me. I didn't think I could do it on my own. There were so many different factors at play. But my Aunt Marianne, I'll never forget, she's like, if you start this, she's like, if it's what God wants you to do, like, he'll bless it and Mm -hmm. he'll make it grow. And I held on to those words, Nick. I really did. Those were, you know, I held on to them. And she was right. And God really just blessed and and touched my platform. And he's, he's made it grown so much, which has been incredible. But yeah, I mean, I started it as a means for me to share the research I was doing for my mom with other people going through cancer. And then little by little, it just kind of expanded to encompass other, you know, areas of holistic health, Mm -hmm. mindfulness, gut health, nutrition, all our favorite topic areas. But yeah, Mm. I mean, that's that story in and of itself is so beautiful and so passion and emotional and so emotionally provocative. Was your, when you started going down all these things, was your mom receptive to the things you were learning or was she getting like different inputs from maybe, I don't know if she was going through the more traditional conventional cancer route. Walk us through that a little bit. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a great question. So I'd say her first diagnosis in 2008, I was too young and ignorant, I would say to really be open to anything else aside from what her conventional oncologist told her to do. So her her breast cancer was ER positive. So she was on a drug called tamoxifen, an aromatase inhibitor for about 10 years. That's protocol. Hindsight's 2020, but looking back, I never would have had her, never would have wanted her to, to have done that therapy. Um, obviously it didn't work because her cancer recurred 10 years later, but um, she was always of the mentality of, you know, follow what your doctor says. I feel like it's a generational thing, at least in my experience, usually the older people who don't really question their doctors as much, but I really think her second, her recurrence was a wake up call as it is for most people that, you know, something in your life is not right. You need to change something in your lifestyle, be it your stress, your sleeping patterns, certainly your nutrition, you know, emotional health. But she was very, very open, um, certainly to, you know, trying new things, integrating new therapies into her treatment protocol. I I do like the word integrative approach, right? Because that implies that you're combining conventional with complementary, right? It's not strictly alternative. I think there is a place for surgery. Um, radiation, the more I read, the less inclined I am to, you know, recommend that patients do it. Certainly that's everyone's own choice, but my mom did have radiation to her spinal tumors. Again, hindsight's 2020 would not have had her do that knowing what I know now, but to answer your question, yes, she's definitely on board with trying everything and anything. She's been doing high dose IVC for a while. She started Mm -hmm. doing mistletoe therapy, working with a naturopathic oncologist in addition to her conventional oncologist, Mm -hmm. but to your question, it has been a struggle balancing those two opinions because her conventional oncologist is not quite on board with a lot of things. So I've gotten into a few heated discussions with him. But again, I think at the end of the day, you have to be your own advocate and it is your life. You have to do what is in best interest of yourself and your health. And I think that's really important 
to have a care team, right, that has different perspectives, because then, you know, it's it's better for you in the long run. Mm. And just for some background on listeners, and Jacqueline, please correct me if I say this incorrectly, ER positive, meaning it's estrogen receptor, or it's estrogen sensitive cancer, meaning the higher levels of estrogens, in theory, are sort of making the cancer worse, for lack of a better term. And then you give the Correct. aromatase inhibitor to prevent the conversion of some of the precursors of estrogen to estrogen. So that way you are trying not to further spread and metastasize the condition. Exactly. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 And, then- and I mean, usually ER positive breast cancer, as they say, are the quote unquote easiest to treat because there are so many different, you know, drugs, for example, that block estrogen. But again, cancer is smart and it does develop cancer cells do develop resistance right to these treatments which is why aromatase inhibitors can only work for so long before a patient has to switch to another drug so again that's just the difference in you know the paradigm of how you treat cancer from conventional versus a more integrative or complementary approach i want to i want to come back we're going to put a bow on the idea of cancer being smart I, i i love in both that's also the what makes it crazy but going back to what you said about the word integrative it's so interesting how there's there's obviously plenty of people who are more holistic and natural. And even some of these people come into me and they'll say, oh, I'm anti-Western medicine. And in the beginning, I'm like, yeah. And then now that I'm further in my career, like you just said, I realized that to be on either extreme isn't necessarily the answer. Like to truly be integrative, like you said, is to understand that there is a, a place for any modality, any tool. And it's the the interweaving of those two worlds that actually is the most beautiful rather than just specifically conventional or specifically natural holistic alternative. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's funny you say that because I was having a conversation in one of my podcast interviews the other week. And I feel like that same concept applies across any spectrum. So we were chatting about the context of nutrition, right? Who to trust in the space in terms of what diet do you follow? You know, what do you adhere to? It's so challenging. It's worse than politics. And I was saying, I think the people that I've come to trust most in the health space are those who aren't really sure of themselves, right? Mm. And that sounds counterintuitive, but I think it's the folks that use language like, you know, this may have an effect or, you know, there's a lot of nuance involved. I think the people who are quote unquote, so sure of things and certain are the ones that you really have to question. Um, to your point about the extremes, again, I mean, you know, same concept. I think if you're so rigid in your thought that you're not open to new modalities, it means that there's something deeper at play there, right? Rather right. than just your belief in whatever your belief is. It's about you wanting to be right. So that's been an interesting, I guess, area of enlightenment for me, enlightenment for me over the past, I don't know, handful of months or so. Hmm. And it's all, it's also tough though, because a lot of the general population wants the, the certainty, wants the absoluteness of the answer. And I, I think it's changing though. I think people and correct, correct me if you see anything differently are more into nuance. I mean, the fact that podcasting exists now sort of tells you that people want deep conversation and don't just want the headline. So it, it, in a sense, especially the fact that like Joe Rogan's is you, people can think what you want about him when he has nutrition experts on it, like people listen for three hours. So it's like, it seems like people want the gray area now. Absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. They do. Yeah. They do. And I think too, I mean, going back to like, there's so much information, there's so much nuance. Podcasts are wonderful, right? They're wonderful outlets for people to learn and educate themselves But I think you also have to be careful about who you listen to, right? And that's why I think it's always important to reconcile what you hear with what you read, which is why I'm a really big advocate of people educating themselves on how to actually read scientific literature, right? To be able to go to a PubMed study, not just read through the conclusions, but actually read through, you know, how is this performed? Who is it sponsored by? What are the controls? Is this, you know, double-blinded placebo and again really understand the nature of the study to be able to make an informed decision and say okay xyz was done and this was the outcome right so i think there's a healthy balance in terms of being able to correctly you know understand a study and again like reconcile that 
you know, just be discerning of what's truthful and what's not. Mm. And is that a situation where did you go to PubMed immediately yourself or did you sort of have to build up to that level? Yeah, I mean, definitely it took me well over a decade of understanding how to even read a research study. Um, I would say that the writing of my thesis definitely helped sharpen those skills. So I worked with um, a professor within like the science department at my my undergraduate college, and he definitely opened my eyes as to, you know, what resources to trust again, like how to read certain studies. So that was definitely helpful. But yeah, I mean, I think sadly today, folks just tend to read headlines of articles and obviously what with, you know, Instagram's algorithm and whatnot, like. It, it breaks my heart, but people will just post things because they know it's going to get a lot of traction when in reality, it's not necessarily true or it's the complete opposite of that, right? So going back to the point about, you know, how to be discerning, um, it, it takes a while, but I think once you get the hang and you can kind of look at things with a more skeptical eye, um, it it's better for you in the long run. Mm. And as you go through that, that iterative process with your thesis, how was that once you turned it in, how was it received? Like, were people like, oh my gosh, like this, like you, you should build a career in this or anything like that, or walk us through a little bit about what sort of happened after you completed that. Yeah, that's a great question. The first memory that came to mind, Nick, it's really funny that you say that. So I had, um, I had two quote unquote advisors that read my thesis once it was completed and they essentially graded the paper. And I remember I got stuck with the two most difficult advisors. <laughs> they had this reputation of being, you know, whatever, challenging a lot of things. They mm-hmm. were both in like the mathematics and sciences um, divisions. And it was funny because my feedback from both of them was, it was very, very well received. Um, in fact, one of them was like, you should actually publish this. And, you know, I'm, I got, it, it was I got great accolades from them and I was just very, very grateful. Um, so they, they definitely loved it. And I think just that affirmation from them made me realize, wait, there's something here. I was able to convince a skeptic who otherwise, you know, didn't think, or how do I say it? Didn't think like truthfully of anything in alternative medicine, um, to be able to actually say like, wait, you've convinced me of certain things. That was a big affirmation for me. So I think that was the nature of my writing too. I've probably lost some writing skills because I haven't written a paper like that in so long. But again, to be able to know that I was able to write something and change the opinion of someone who was so, I guess, staunch in their previous thought was definitely affirming. Mm. And it, and it's the the skill sets that you, I'm sure, learned along that journey that you then take with you, even though maybe not writing specifically in podcasting and any content creative outlet, it's still the that foundations that you learn that you can take with you as you go to those other things. Yeah, no, absolutely. And again, yeah. I mean, when I first started well and strong, I did write most of my content and then as it continued to grow, I wanted to get more functional doctors to write content. So my writing became less and less over time, which was beneficial to, you know, from a time perspective, but I still do enjoy writing. I definitely do. It's something that I need to give more time to, mm. but it's a skill that you'll always use in life. Yeah. And it's also interesting that in the age of chat GPT and so many people have other things written for them, like they'll, to still have that skill though, is so powerful that it's, I think still needed. And so you, you're going through all this journey, you have, you have the thesis. And then at what point do you realize like, Hey, I'm going to start a brand. I'm going to, I'm going to start well and strong. Like I'm going to start writing specifically for these things. Like people need to know about the integrative cancer world. Yeah. I mean, again, three years, November 15th is when it really started. So I think I just accumulated all this research. Um, I was at a low point in my life. And again, I just wanted to help others because I was struggling. And that's when it was really birthed. So it was my saving grace in more ways than one. It gave me something to work at, something to look forward to. And yeah, again, it just, it grew from there. God touched it. And it's been a journey. It really has, but I've been enjoying it every step of the way. And I'm trying to remain, or how do I say it? I'm trying to retain the passion I have for it because I think mm. over time when you're working at something for so long and, you know, so hard, you don't ever want to resent it. Right. And I think that's always been a fear in the back of my mind is this is my passion. So I don't ever want my passion to be considered work, which is why to my point earlier, I'm really working on balance, but 
when you figure it out, let us know. Right right now, it's basically just me every morning, like writing down top five priorities, things to do, like mm. take time, five minutes to meditate, go for like lunch walk, little things like that, that help, but it's a journey. Yeah. And that, that that's a really good follow-up question. How do you feel like your relationship with your own health changed as you learned about your mom's diagnosis? And then as you started learning about all the things with, with cancer specifically, I'm sure thoughts came up about how you can live your own life in sort of a manner you deem most applicable. Yeah. That's a really great question. I'd say one of the biggest things, like key takeaways for anyone listening who either has cancer or who knows someone with a cancer diagnosis it's the importance of managing stress and emotional health. So there have been numerous, numerous studies that have shown that stress can actually promote cancer metastasis. Um, and oftentimes to a patient who has a diagnosis of cancer, if you look back, you know, a year or two years prior to that diagnosis, there oftentimes will have been a really stressful event in that person's life that typically you can kind of trace that to, which I find very, very interesting. But I think for me, it's really just been learning to manage that stress because it is a lot at times. And I, you know, I know like what's the the phrase, you feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders, right? In terms of being able to make decisions and, you know, do what's best for someone in your family. But for me, it's really been learning to take a step back and manage that stress and really focus on my emotional health and recognize that, you know, at the end of the day, we are not in control right? God is in control. Mm -hmm. That has been life-changing for me to be able to step back and say, you know what, God, like this is in my hands. This is in your hands. And that no matter what I do, like, you know, the outcome you are in control. So that was a long-winded answer, but basically just working on prioritizing my mental and my emotional health have been my own key takeaways. Mm. And, And like you said, understanding that we, we can control the input, but he controls the output. Yeah. Which I, I actually, I'm curious to get your commentary on this. I feel like in the cancer world, does it, do you find like, does it bring a lot of people closer to even closer to their faith or to, to start to develop a faith practice? That's a great question. I feel like it's one of those things that could go either way, right? I feel like someone could receive a cancer diagnosis and if they were a person of faith, you know, turn and, and, you know, kind of shake their hands at God and say, why me? I don't understand. Um, or again, I could bring them closer. And I think the two aspects of that is, you know, the former, if someone's angry at their diagnosis and they're angry with God, those emotions are not healthy. Right. Yes. And mm-hmm. over time, like that actually makes the cancer worse. Um, and I think the latter and I'm not sure if you're familiar with Chris Ward, but he basically, he's known as Chris Beat Cancer. He's a big advocate of complementary medicine. I had him on my podcast a few weeks ago. He overcame stage three colon cancer, but he's basically a patient advocate. And one thing he says is that cancer happened like for me, not to Mm. me. And it was a gift, Mm. right? And I think the people that are in the boat of viewing cancer as a gift are really the ones that end up beating the disease in the long run because they just shift their mindset to one of gratitude and they say okay this diagnosis is actually a good thing it can help change my life in so many different ways right I improve my nutrition I forgive all the people that have hurt me in my life I achieve better emotional health so you know I mean when push comes to shove I obviously haven't been in this position but I think you know at the time of the diagnosis that decision of you know, trusting God or being mad at him really plays a big role in the outcome of your disease for sure. Mm -hmm. And for the listeners, stage three colon cancer, by the time it gets to stage three of the colon, not only is it aggressive, but you're likely looking at surgery to remove part of your bowels. So you just have so many things stacked against you to not make you believe in healing. So to say this happened for me is like such a, a, a revelation considering the deck is sort of stacked against you almost at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And there, there was something you said earlier about, you know, receiving the diagnosis of, of cancer. And I have to imagine for some people being told you have cancer is probably just as stressful, if not more, and this might be a hyperbolic statement, than maybe the existing stress the cancer was causing. 
Yep. How do you feel Absolutely. about that? I, I think that's spot on. And again, I think Chris also speaks a lot about this, but the fear that occurs when a doctor tells a patient they have cancer, again, like it's kind of like self-fulfilling prophecy, right? In the sense of like a doctor says something, they quote unquote put like this like medical hex over the patient by saying, if you don't do this, you have this amount of time to live or this is what's going to happen. And that's why I think it's really important for the patient to just stand on truth, right? And you have to reject whatever the oncologist is saying, that person's not God. And you have to just speak, you know, affirmations and words of truth over yourself. Like mm. I am healthy, I am whole, like I will be healed. Um, but yeah, to your point, I mean, I think fear is the worst thing, right? <laughs> like if, if you have, if you're fearful about something, your body reacts to those thoughts, right? So it creates stress within your body as well. Again, like our body reacts to what our mind tells it. So again, easier said than done. Right. But I think the best approach with any diagnosis is to really, you know, take a step back, take a breath. Don't let fear control you not only from an emotional perspective, but from a decision perspective, right. When you're in a state of fear, I mean, studies have shown like you're not able to think clearly. Right. And you're therefore rushed into making decisions on things that may not benefit you, right. Or may not be beneficial for you in the long run. Right. But your doctor is pushing it right now. So again, it's, it's not easy, but I think, you know, being aware of that emotional state when you're in the office and not letting it control you is, is really key. Mm. And what is it that you think that, and maybe that's part of it as in, why do you think so many people fear the word cancer. Like, I feel like even to say that in public conversation, someone says, oh, so-and-so is diagnosed with cancer. Everyone's like, oh my goodness, where it could be as simple as just a, a melanoma that gets removed, or it's like stage four pancreatic cancer that the person's probably not going to live more than six months. Like, why do you think that word in and of itself just induces so much fear in people? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, in short, I think it's because there's no quote unquote cure for it. Mm. Right. I mean, People can say you can you can cure like stage one, stage two cancers by removing it from the body, but not necessarily recognizing that cancer daughter cells still remain in the body post surgery, post any type of treatment, and it's your immune system that really does the job of cleaning up those cancer cells, um, which is why it's so important to make sure you have a healthy immune system. But I mean, I also think because again, the nature of our healthcare system, it's so corrupt. <laughs> And I think to your point about fear, right? Like a cancer diagnosis is probably like one of the most fearful things someone could get just because again, there is no cure. There's not a lot of, how do I say it? There's not a lot of situations, Nick, where people like a hundred percent recover from it that are actually shared with the public, mm. right? So like mm. I could, let me rephrase that. There are so many cases of people with stage four cancers that are able to put it completely into remission. There's an incredible book by Kelly Turner. It's called Radical Remission. And she basically was this PhD student who traveled the world and she just observed stage four cancer patients who were able to completely put their cancer into remission and she wrote this book about these are the, you know, seven or nine common themes across the board that these people used to heal. And you don't really hear that, right? In the conventional healthcare space, you don't hear oncologists saying, oh, you can heal from a stage four cancer because A, they're not aware of it. B, they are and don't want to share that. Or, you know, C, they're not quote unquote allowed to share that because they're mm -hmm. binded by quote unquote the gold standard when it comes to, you know, treating cancer. So there's so many factors at play, but again, I think education and knowledge is power. So again, if a patient's diagnosed with stage four cancer, do your research and find out other stage four cancer patients who have healed, right? Then you won't have that fear. You'll have a sense of empowerment knowing that you can do it. Um, and Chris Work's podcast is basically just, he interviews tons and tons of cancer patients from stage one to stage four that have healed themselves through natural modalities. And it's just, it's incredible. And it's very empowering. Mm, that belief effect. Yeah, absolutely. Which, which is separate from the placebo. And maybe we don't need to dive into that. But you said the there were seven of or seven to nine things that this in the book radical commissions that we said it was called. 
Radical remission. Radical remission. You said seven to nine things that th this woman found. Were, are there any of those that are sort of unconventional that things that, because I'm sure like nutrition, sleep, exercise were a few of those, but were there any that you're like, oh, I didn't expect that to be something in there? Interestingly, what I touched on before, um, forgiveness and emotional health was huge. So there were cases where people just forgave someone in their life that caused them a lot of pain mm -hmm. and cancer just went into remission, which is absolutely like incredible. So that concept of releasing suppressed emotions and interestingly in Chinese medicine too, they correlate organs with different emotions. So someone who's very angry, for example, I'm sure you know this, like that, that sits in the liver right? So if someone has a liver problem, they say like the underlying root of that is anger. And I think that area is so, so fascinating. But yeah, I mean, releasing suppressed emotions was one of them. Um, radically changing your diet was another one. That sense of empowerment, taking control of your health, increasing positive emotions, embracing social support. Again, those are all things that you don't get in a conventional oncologist's office, right? And they're not hard things to do either. And that's the irony. It's they're relatively simple changes to make in your life that have such massive impact. Mm. And I feel like you hope it's one of those things where when people listening to this, hear that they feel a sense of like, Oh, like these are things I can do versus I imagine there's a subset of people who want to be told um, you just need this surgery or this radiate, or they want it to seem because maybe to them that sounds easier than having to completely change their moral foundation and their mindset to, th to then think positively. Like if you've been a, a, a negative Nancy, if there's anyone named Nancy listening, I'm sorry, your whole life to then hear that being positive is helpful might actually be harder, might be the hardest thing for you to grasp and then shift and it'd be easier for you to just take your chemotherapy and radiation and, and move on with your life. Hope yeah. potentially. Yeah. There's even tunic. I mean, are you familiar with Bruce Lipton by any chance? Yeah. Biology belief. Fantastic. Book. He has yeah. highly, highly recommend that book for anyone listening. And yeah, I mean, his whole, he, he's like the pioneer of this whole area. I mean, he's been preaching this for years and years. I, I don't agree with everything he says, but there is a lot of power in terms of like, again, how your biology reacts to your thoughts. And a great example of this is there was a study done not too long ago where patients were given, um, or rather they split a group of patients into two groups, right? So one group received chemotherapy, the other group didn't. And in the group that did not receive chemo, but thought they were, it was just a saline solution. I think it was like 70% of them lost their hair just because mm. they believed that they were receiving chemotherapy, which mm. is just mind blowing, right? And I think, again, the more I read, the more I'm like, it's not necessarily the treatment itself, although that plays a big role. It's more of what you think of the treatment, right? Mm. So even if a patient does, you know, decide to pursue chemotherapy, they need to think of that chemo as like liquid gold, right? That's going into their bodies, like killing the cancer, not harming their healthy cells. And that's what it will do, right? If that's what you think, same thing with food. If you're eating something and you're thinking, oh, this is so bad for me. It's you, you and I were chatting about this on my podcast. It's the whole gluten thing, right? Like if you eat gluten and you have this preconception that gluten's bad for you, after you have that piece of bread, you're going to be like, I'm a wreck. I have brain fog. I'm breaking out in hives. And it's like, well, is that really the gluten or is that your perception and your thoughts of what the gluten is doing to your body, right? And I know like Dr. Axe is like, he's been talking about, about this for a while too, but it's your thoughts are so, so powerful, truly with anything. So I think, you know, with anything that you're doing, if you believe that what you're doing is working, whether it's mistletoe or IVC or off-label drugs, it will work if, if you believe it will, so- mm. I think everyone listening should go back and replay that last 120 to 180 seconds, because if you are to start anywhere with your health, or if you are a, a wreck and you need a place to turn, th that that belief effect is where you should start. And 100%. yeah, and what I was saying earlier about placebo versus belief is the belief effect is the idea that your physiology actually changes. So even in a study you mentioned, people lost less hair or they lost more hair because they thought that's not placebo, that's objective versus placebo is you feel, say people have fatigue and they feel better. Well, that's placebo. But if they have fatigue and their inflammatory markers get get better, that's 
physiologic change. That's belief. So you can have, you can yeah. use the two of those. And anytime I hear things about this, I it's hard for me to reconcile. Like, why do we even study IV vitamin C, probiotics, supplements, nutrition? Why do we spend so much time studying that stuff if the belief is just as, if not more, powerful than the actual modality? I know that's yeah. the golden question. I mean, I think to answer that, I think so. For example, if you take like IVC those studies will hopefully show and many have the benefits of IVC, right? Boosting your immune system, like increasing NK cell activity, your natural killer cells, which are so, so important for cancer patients. And I think once a patient sees those studies, right, it's kind of like it feeds into that belief system, right? So if you read a study that's done on IVC and you see all these positive effects, then when you yourself are doing it, your body's going to react to those effects, right? By what you're reading. So I feel like there needs to be some type of tangible evidence or sense that something works in order for someone to believe it. Right. And I mean, again, like that's the whole premise of faith too, right? Mm. Like you have to you know, believe in what you can't see, but I think in medical, you know, in the medical world, at least what I've seen is there has to be some type of tangible, hopeful, positive outcome that patients need to see in order to have that sense of belief that it's going to work. Yeah. There needs to be a window and, and, exactly. and in, pre in previous traditions, you had faith. So you didn't need a window because you sort of had faith on the other side. Something was there. Now it's like people need a window because our society has lost a, a large sense of their faith-based practice. And I want, I want to touch on IV vitamin C real quick. So when some people hear that, if they're not familiar, walk us through a little bit about you know, cause I'm sure most people listening have taken a vitamin C tablet or an emergency, not that that's like a brand I love, but you know, that that's, that's what their idea of it. So here IV vitamin C, like, Oh, you just put a packet of that in an IV and then it just drips into you or. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So basically it's, it's a really, really interesting and there have been a, a decent amount of studies on this, but basically the mechanism by which high dose IVC works is that when you receive a certain threshold of concentration of vitamin C in your bloodstream through IV, it actually starts to generate hydrogen peroxide in the bloodstream. And that is selectively toxic to cancer cells. And I know a lot about this because I actually just interviewed a doctor who specializes this on my podcast, but most cancer cells lack this enzyme called catalase that basically helps to break down excess hydrogen peroxide. And um, you, you, you see that when you put like hydrogen peroxide on a cut, like the white stuff foaming is the exactly. catalase activity working. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. So by taking advantage of the lack of that enzyme and creating a lot of hydrogen peroxide, which is an oxidative therapy, it's highly toxic to cancer cells. And I mean, you know, there's even some oncologists now conventional who are starting to recognize that high dose IVC is a powerful, um, like adjuvant treatment for cancer because it acts synergistically with a lot of standard, you know, therapies like chemo, um, even just in terms of like helping to mitigate the toxic side effects, you know, of those therapies, which is really interesting, but yeah, it's just, it's a fascinating, fascinating therapy. I mean, there's really no negative side effects to it. Again, the only issue is that it's challenging to find a practitioner to do it. Um, especially on the East coast, it's more mm. popular in like States like Colorado and out West, but, um, yeah, it's very, very powerful therapy. Mm. And in addition to that, on the, on the nutrition front, are there any, you know, uh, people have obviously written books about like the anti-cancer diet and things like that, but from your read of the the literature, are there any core principles or foundations that people have found when it comes to nutrition for cancer prevention? Yeah. Nick, this is such a great question. This could be a whole episode. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I just dropped that just, one in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah just, just dedicated to nutrition. Everyone's different. Right. 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 So for example, I mean, most of my research has been within looking at patients who have ER positive breast cancer. Right. And within that specific case, I'm a big fan of what is called a ketotarian diet. So what does that look like? It's primarily plants. So most of your plate should have plants on it. Why? Because plants contain, contain fiber, which helps to remove excess estrogen from your body, which is what you want in someone with an ER positive cancer, right? There's minimal amounts of animal protein, you know, mostly lean sources, salmon, wild caught salmon, um, 
you know, turkey, chicken, again, with most of your plate being plants. So I'm a big advocate of that. I mean, if you look at other cancers like glioblastoma, for example, like very, very aggressive brain cancers, a patient might benefit more from a ketogenic diet. Um, ketogenic diets for cancer are also a very, very nuanced area. And I think the more that I personally read about them, I think they're beneficial in the short term for managing, again, very aggressive cancers like glioblastoma. But I think in the long term, it's not necessarily great for a cancer patient. Um, in fact, there's even studies that have shown cancer cells, again, going back to the fact that they're so smart and they adapt, actually can feed on ketones or other fatty acids if you restrict their intake of glucose and glutamine. And, you know, there's been so many wonderful people in the field who have done research on that, but I think the most important thing is to just pulse therapies, right? So if someone mm. opts for a keto diet, pulse it, right? Do it for three months, take three months off because you don't want to necessarily give the cancer cells a chance to adapt to that, right? And I think that's key with any therapy you do. So yeah, I mean, it 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 really depends. But I, I think at the end of the day, quality is very, very important no matter what you're doing, right? So if you are eating meat, Make sure it's grass-fed meat. Organic is always best. Fish, wild-caught fish. Um, obviously, try to purchase organic produce when you can. So things like that. Mm. And on the on the ketogenic front, I remember learning as well that the the white blood cells or you know the soldiers of our immune system can't run off of ketones. They can only run off of glucose, or they predominantly use glucose as a fuel. So to completely rid yourself of any glucose coming in, it's like well, the, the main army responsible for fighting the cancer now has been sort of devote of its resources. Nick, exactly. And yeah. that's essentially like one of the major arguments that I also have as to why I don't necessarily think it's, it's healthy because your healthy cells need glucose to function. Right. And even if you completely restrict glucose from your diet, your body will start producing glucose in your liver, right? It's called gluconeogenesis and cancer cells could use that to fuel themselves. So it's really, again, it's not black and white. Mm. And to the idea of, of adaptation, like you so beautifully talked about, it's almost as if this is my, me being ignorant and you being more of, more of the, that, that subject matter expert in this is when someone gets a cancer diagnosis, it's like, that's almost the way I think about it is it's your body's way of saying the existing environment internally and externally in which you have put me in my adaptations have now led to this. So if you want to alter the output, you have to alter the input so that we can drive a different adaptation. You said it beautifully. You're the expert, Nick, not me. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. That's that's spot on, which is again, why I'm a big fan of a terrain-based approach. And if you look at like a ketogenic diet, for example, right? I mean, again, another one of my arguments why I don't necessarily think it's super great long-term is because ketogenic diets in most cases tend to restrict consumption or have less of a consumption of plants, right? Because plants have carbohydrates in them. They're healthy carbs, but if you want to be in a therapeutic state of ketosis, you're not going to have, you know, you're not going to necessarily eat too many plants, which in my opinion is really not great. Why? Because we know that plant diversity is essential for our microbiome health. And we know that over 70% of our immune system is located in our microbiome, in our gut. So in my opinion, if you're focusing on a terrain-based approach to cancer, meaning you want to make your immune system as strong as it is to go and attack cancer cells throughout your entire body, you want to optimize your digestive health, right? Which a ketogenic diet might not necessarily do as much as a more, you know, plant-centric diet would. So again, it's just, it's different, it's different thought patterns. And again, that's why I think, you know, for really aggressive cancers, keto might be great short term, but you know you switch it up. Mm. And do you feel like it's the the addition of the excess plant matter and fiber diversity and polyphenol diversity that is more important than the restriction of like the high processed food, high processed meat? Because I'm always going back and forth when I work with people is like if we shift the mindset toward one of abundance and foods to include, and we take away like. The, the demonization of gluten, dairy, and red meat, or even if, you know, you're carnivore, like plants, like take away the demonization aspect and put it on the inclusion. Yeah. You feel like that's where people get a lot of benefit from as well? Or how would you think about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And I think too, I mean, that's something my mom struggled with is when she was trying to get into this state of therapeutic ketosis for the past, you know, three or so months before we were like, you know what, let's take a step back. This might not be the best for you. She was so stressed, Nick, about what she was eating because she couldn't eat anything basically because her body just in order to be in therapeutic ketosis. I mean, again, everyone's different. She essentially had to eat like nothing or eat like solely like protein, which is also really not great. Um, especially for a cancer patient. So she was stressed, right, about what to eat and what she couldn't eat. And that stress, as you know, we alluded to earlier, is the last thing you want, um, especially for someone with metastasized cancer. So the irony, again, you, you hit the nail on the head, that, you know, ideology of abundance when you eat, like that's the most healthy for you, right? When you think of like, this food is going to nourish my body. I'm not going to think about how it's going to hurt me. I'm going to think about how it's going to help me. If I have a handful of blueberries, right? Like I'm not going to worry that that's going to knock me out of ketosis. I'm going to think of all the, you know, antioxidants and, you know, polyphenols that my body are, is getting right now to build my immune system and my healthy cells. So, I mean, we've come full circle with the whole mindset, but that's really what it comes down to. Mm-hmm. I always think it's funny when people, I'm sure you get this, you'll be at a family gathering or whatnot, and they'll be like, oh, they're, they're the healthy eater as if it's their passion, which the fact that they word it in that sense tells you that the way that they view they eat is not healthy, which like we were talking about earlier, if you believe it's not healthy, like that's just making it worse. So it's almost like, I, I don't know. It's just, it's just so funny how they, by admitting that like, oh, this person is health conscious, they're admitting that they are not health conscious, which is not helping their health in any sense of the matter. Yeah, no, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I think too, I mean, some folks are, you know, you're all in or you're all out. I tend to be one of those sometimes. And I'm again, working on that in all areas of my life in terms of having more of a balance. But I think especially in the health space, right? Like it doesn't have to be so extreme, if you decide to get healthy one day, it's like New Year's resolutions, like January 1st, I'm going to go to the gym every single day. And it's like day two, you miss your gym workout. It's like, oh, let's just slash the other three tires. No, right. That's not how it has to be. It's just, again, integrating healthy practices into your lifestyle, changing your mindset, not necessarily having this concept of restriction with anything, right? Like that's, that's health. Like that's living a healthy life. That's what it really comes down to. Mm, amen. Mm. I'm going to transition a little bit now to talking about the brand well and well and strong in and of itself. Did you expect it to have the the growth that it's had? Or you did you expect to be able to get the the prowess of guests that you've had on your show? I mean, the fact that you had me on there, considering you've had like Terry Walls and Chris Cresser, I'm like, man, that that's wild to think that I'm on the same podcast as what those people have been on. What are you saying? No, you're, <laughs> you're one of my favorite interviews. It still is to this very day. Um, no, I, I did not at all. Um, again, it's just, it's a testament to what God has done in my life. And I, I really do give him all the glory. It's not me, it's him. And when he touches something, like he touches it, right? And I remember when I started it, again, I was in a really dark place didn't know what was going to come of it. Didn't really have any solid belief in myself that I could build it on my own, but I just kept at it and I trusted God and he brought the right people and the right opportunities into my life. And I will say for anyone looking to build something right now, persistence is key. It truly, truly is. It's just like the power of one more, Mm. um, just one more time, right? If someone says no, reach out to them one more time. Like, do you know, one more rep in the gym, like one, one more prayer, one more, just being persistent. Um, it really, you know, it really does make a difference, but yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, it's, it's been a journey. I've been having so much fun doing it. It's just a matter now for me of trying to hone in and pick a focus because I think there are so many things I want to be doing, but you know, it's like, if you chase two rabbits, you're not going to catch either one. Mm -hmm. So right now my focus has been on my podcast, which I've been enjoying so much, but it is a lot. Again, people are like, who's your team? And I'm like, me, myself (laughs) and I. Yeah, you're looking at her. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, again, it's just the greatest joy that I've gotten from it has been able to see people respond in such a positive manner saying your content has really changed my life or it's been helping me. 
um, quick, funny side story. I was walking, I don't know, three or so weeks ago on the Swamp Rabbit Trail here in Greenville and just, you know, had my baseball cap on, my headphones in, like ignoring the world. Zoned it out. Yeah. And, and someone stopped me and they were like, excuse me, are are you a nutritionist? And I was like, yes. Like I, I technically am. I don't like really identify as one because I don't work one-on-one with patients, but he was like, yeah. He's like, did you write a guide for, for breast cancer? And I looked at him, I was like, yes. And he's like, I share that guide with my patients. And my mouth just like dropped like to the floor, like some random stranger. And basically wow. he's a physician's assistant who heard about well and strong from one of the nurses at his practice. And he shares my content with his patients. And if I needed like any affirmation, Nick, that the work that I was doing, you know, was, was worth it. Like on those really late nights and I'm like, Oh, like, is it even worth it? I just, I think of that and I'm like, no, it is like, it's helping people. So that was just really, you know, really cool to, to see that. And yeah, just again, to see how, how God's been working. So yeah, that is divine yeah. if I've ever heard it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Do you still feel like you, your, your passions are still aligned with working sort of in the business on the researching new content, researching new therapies versus working on the business and the planning, the forecasting, the, the, the long-term strategy, how would you walk us through how you've thought about that. Yeah. It's a great question. The former is where I like to spend my time. Um, the latter is where I need to spend my time just because again, it's me, myself, and I, I think the cool thing though, is that the college I went to Babson, they're known for entrepreneurship. Right. And when I, when I, when I first went to college, I knew that I wanted to have my own business one day. So I think the beauty with well and strong is that it's essentially a combination of those two passions, right? Entrepreneurship and wellness and there's so much opportunity within that. So it really does come down to the day. Like, what what am I in the mood for? Like, am I in the mood to research and write content? You know, am I in the mood to prioritize where I want to take my business next? What direction I want to head into? But I use different parts of my brain for each. Um, obviously, right now, it's just, you know, I have to do everything. But I think, you know, the real area of interest is within that that research area. Mm. And the, what you said right there of the the research part is what we love to do and the other stuff is what we need to do that yep yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah, amen. That's, yeah a, amen every every step of the word so you've talked about it a little bit but now that we're closing on the end of the hour here why don't you you know pay the bills plug your stuff let the listeners know where they can learn more about you more about this podcast more about this brand that we've been that we've been touching on yeah no absolutely well first of all Nick thank you so much for having me on I I'm a big fan of yours and your work I think you're brilliant again I encourage your listeners to go listen to your episode on the how to be well and strong podcast we spoke about what was it regulating nervous your nervous mm-hmm. system nervous your system, system. Mm-hmm. yeah great episode um but no, I, I truly enjoy this conversation. Listeners can find me. So I have a blog. It is called Well and Strong. So wellandstrong.com. Um, I do have social media. The irony is I don't ever use my personal social media accounts, but I'm quite active on Well and Strong because it's my business. Um, so you can find me on Instagram. That's at well.n.strong. And my podcast that I started this past year is called How to Be Well and Strong. And that's available on all different platforms. Um, and I, you know, obviously appreciate people letting me know the types of content they want to hear. I try to, you know, meet them where they're at. So if anyone has any specific requests, please feel free to drop me a DM. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And we'll put up all that information in the show notes. And I would highly encourage anyone, even if you don't know, I mean, I'm assuming all of us that know at least one person who's been touched by cancer. It's, it's, it's great reads. It's, it's great insights and it's, it's, it's phenomenal information in a time where we need to have more of that holistic and integrative approach. All right, Thank you, Nick. Jacqueline, yeah, last, you. last question. Oh, sorry. Were you going to say something? Oh yeah. I was just going to say last thing too. I forgot to mention for your listeners. Um, I did write a breast cancer guide. It's about 30 pages. It's the shortened version of all the research that I've done. That is available for free on my website in the free mm-hmm. guide section. It's called an integrative approach to breast cancer covers everything from nutrition, supplementation, some of the therapies that we had discussed. So highly encourage listeners to check that out too. Please do. Mm. All right. Last question here. So this is gut check radio. So really it's just been exploring the gut check moments along your health, wellness, personal, professional journey. 
And as the last question I'd like to leave people with is walk us through your most recent gut check moment and how you navigated through that. Ooh, that's such a good question. Hmm. Can be personal, okay. professional. Yeah. I would say it actually happened last week and I consider myself a yes man in the sense of someone asked me to do something. I'm like, yes, I will be there. I will do this for you. Um, I never want to say no because I never want to let people down. And I had a friend invite me to her birthday dinner. That was this past week. And knowing that I had about three different podcast interviews, I'm taking some time off next week. My time is very limited. I had to stop myself before saying yes and say, is this really the best thing for me at this point in time? And that was kind of a gut check to say, okay, like, do I have boundaries set up in my life right now? Am I, you know, overexerting myself in a certain area? So long story short, I, I declined sadly, but I said, we'll celebrate when I get back. But it was just a good check-in for me to say, okay, you know, am I prioritizing my health and my time, you know, rather than feeling the need to say yes to, to everyone and everything, which I'm still working on. It's always a balance act. It, it is. It is. Yeah. And sometimes the making the what not to do list can be just as impactful and helping yeah. us prioritize. That's a great question though. I love that. Yeah. And that's where the podcast was born from right there. Got check. Moments. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Perfect. Well, Jacqueline, thank you for your time. It's been a blast. Absolutely. No, thank you. I appreciate it. And let me know when the episode's out. I'm excited to share. Absolutely can do. And thank you all for listening.